Welcome to another edition of Russian History with Dr. Borovkin. Today my topic is two years of the war in Ukraine and why is Russia winning? So uh, briefly about the background of the war. There are many videos I did in the past so I don't want to get into it too much. But basically the standard story is that uh, the war in Ukraine is a result of Russian aggression. Uh, uh, Russia attacked independent neighboring state uh, and is conducting now a, a war of aggression to which the Western countries defend the poor Ukraine, the victim of aggression, and provided military aid. That's the standard story. Now, the true story, of course, is that, and this is um, uh, this is what uh, President Putin had said recently, is that uh, in uh, 2014 there was a coup d'état in Ukraine and from the friendly neighbor to Russia uh, overnight Ukraine became a country led by Benderovites, the followers of uh, Stepan Bendera, uh, a Nazi who um, saw his goal in, in collaborating with Hitler whose monuments are now built in Ukraine. But more than that uh, is contemporary issues. It wrote in the constitution of Ukraine, this new government, that it wants to become NATO. Now, many people would say, what's wrong with NATO? Many countries are happy in NATO. Now, the answer, of course, is uh, that if a country is in NATO, that means American bases. That means that there could be missiles put in uh, Kharkov and in uh, any other place in Ukraine, which is three or 400 kilometers to Moscow. And that would mean that the United States changed the status quo. Now, uh, Clausewitz, the famous German um, theoretician of war, wrote that wars happen when there is a change of the status quo. Status quo meaning the way things were before something happened. So uh, what happened was that for 400 years Ukraine was a part of Russia, then the Soviet Union collapsed, it became an independent country and a friendly neighbor, and then the change of the status quo from a friendly neighbor, it turned into an applicant to uh, NATO meaning American basis, which uh, President Putin said that's unacceptable to Russia. By the way, many people said it's unacceptable. Uh, George Cannon, the famous specialist, uh, American specialist in Russian studies, I had the honor of working in his institute back in the 70s and 80s. And Professor Pipes, my colleague from Harvard, also said that this is unacceptable to Russia. This, and many others said, you, President Bush, George, and then his son, uh, both Bushes said that Ukraine is special for, Uk for Russia and you shouldn't, we shouldn't mess with it. And nevertheless, uh, that's pretty much what happened. And uh, Putin, of course, wrote his famous memorandum in December 21 saying, if the West insists on uh, supporting membership of Ukraine in NATO, there will be, quote, military technical means. And then he went to war uh, and then it was branded uh, aggression. So l let me go briefly over the history of the war because that's very important and revealing. So I divide it into four phases. Phase one is a short one and that is the one in uh, the spring of 2022 uh, which uh, uh, saw a quick Russian offensive uh, and uh, Russian troops came to very close to, to capturing Kiev and close to Kharkov uh, and then crossed the Dnieper and took Kherson. Uh, and um, uh, then Putin made a very important announcement. We said, we are not going to occupy Ukraine. So it was clearly that the purpose of the war at that point was to force Ukraine into negotiations. And they indeed started in March. Uh, 22 in Istanbul and they led to an almost complete agreement which was signed but had had to be ratified. The agreement was very very generous. Some people say oh my god in Russia what if they had agreed that would have been really bad because Russia was tr willing to give a lot to Ukraine. Essentially it was a Minsk 3. In other words Ukraine would agree to the autonomy of Donbas 
uh, Lugansk and the Donetsk regions and it would also they found a compromise that shows how willing Putin was to go for a compromise they found a formula that even Crimea was not going to be total Russian territory it was I think the formula was something like uh, like, like um, Hong Kong that Russia would lease a U from Ukraine uh, Crimea for the 99 years or something like that. So they were super willing, the Russians, to go into a compromise uh, solution. Now, uh, now we know from those who participated in these talks that uh, ostensibly Boris Johnson of London came to Kiev and convinced Zelensky that the West would support Ukraine whatever it takes, however long it takes. And so they walked out of these negotiations. Prior to walking out, uh, the uh, Putin now revealed that the uh, Macron and the, and Germany uh, asked uh, Russia as a g gesture of goodwill to uh, remove its troops from uh, Kiev, and they did. Uh, and as a result, the, the it's funny. Uh, Zelensky presented himself as a great liberator of Kiev, because by some magic of his leadership, the Russians left uh, Kiev. That's of course total nonsense. But in any case, so this was the first stage. The second stage was big, big success for Ukraine. This is the summer of '22, and indeed they got the military provisions from the West. They had a mo conducted a general mobilization. They had an army of seven hundred thousand. Of those, about two hundred thousand were really eager to fight Russians, and I. I heard an interview myself on NPR in the United States with one of those Benderovite types who basically openly in NPR said that he described how he hated the Russians and his goal in life was to kill as many Russians as he could. In any case, so this is their big time offensive. Uh, the, they, there was a total preponderance in terms of numbers and they had pretty good uh, supply of arms and in the summer of 22 the Russians abandoned uh, the area around Kharkiv moving about close to 50-70 kilometers uh, eastward. At the same time they voluntarily withdrew from Kiev and in that year uh, there was like steady pressure mounting uh, on the Russian troops and then at the end of the year uh, even uh, um, Kherson, the area in the south facing the Black Sea, uh, General Zoravikin ordered to uh, abandon uh, Kherson. Uh, supposedly because they feared that if uh, if they blew up the dam that everybody will be flooded and we could lose a lot of Russia could lose a lot of soldiers in any case they abandoned her so and this is this is the end of this second phase the third phase is the counter offensive that's the entire year 2023. Now, uh, if you look at the um, media in the West at the end of uh, 22 to early 23, there'll be lots of articles by Zaluzhny, the uh, general staff commander in Ukraine and Zelensky and their ambassadors and all kinds of others. I kept reading reading all of this and they were all saying give us money, give us weapons, give us tanks and Zaluzhny even said exactly how many he wanted, 500. In fact they, the Americans gave them uh, not as many as that but gave quite a lot of Bradleys and ammunitions and uh, the total I think is like a hundred billion dollars worth just the US and then in in a scale uh, descending down to Estonia each one contributed what they could uh, basically emptying their own reserves and uh, stocks uh, piles of uh, uh, ammunition and they actually thought that they would render, and I quote, strategic defeat to Russia. They pl the plan was this. The plan was that they would push towards Azov, the city of Azov, and they would uh, bomb the uh, 
the bridge, uh, the, the Kerch bridge connecting Crimea with uh, the Caucasus. And that way they would surround Crimea and then they would invade from land, air and sea. They would invent, in, invade Crimea and then the push the Russians out of Crimea and of Donbass and win the war. And they seriously thought that that was going to be a plan accomplished in 2023. But it didn't work. So, why didn't it work? Here are a couple of reasons from the Ukrainian, from looking at things from the Ukrainian side. They didn't work because the Western tanks weren't that good. Uh, they, they just kept burning and they couldn't be serviced and they were too heavy and they couldn't pass on Russian bridges and many, many other things. Uh, the second cause is corruption in Ukraine. Uh, we know now that Jedelins, which is anti-tank uh, weapon the U.S. supplied, could be found now in Colombia. And that means that through the black market networks, uh, a lot of ammunition and a lot of money was stolen. The third and the most important, as far as Ukrainians are concerned, is a lack of desire to fight. Uh, men in Ukraine have to be captured on the streets, shoved in a bus, and then uh, and then transferred to the front line. They're, they're not very eager to fight. Now, on the Russian side, there's the opposite. There's uh, every, every month there were more and more volunteers, about 50,000 per month, uh, which means that during the 2023, there was close to 500,000 new troops that were trained and plus the limited mobilization, 300,000. So the estimate is now there's close to a million troops that are uh, some in reserve, some are fighting in Ukraine. The next thing that, that the West discovered uh, is that Russian arms are, are very good. Russian tanks are pretty good, Russian aircraft, and then they really launched from zero the production of drones and, and self-guiding drones and all kinds of other drones uh, that really uh, make a lot of uh, destruction among Ukrainian forces. Uh, Russian military productions doubled and then tripled and then quadrupled and it's just absolutely incredible. Russia produces more shells than the entire NATO, US plus Europe, uh, in, a, in a month. Uh, what Russia, Russia produces in a month would, would take them a year. Uh, so uh, Russian technology, military technology, especially missile technology and aviation and the um, electronic suppression of um, enemy aircraft, all these things are just about the best that there is. So uh, the counteroffensive uh, fizzled out. And then there was this defense that Suravikin built with all kinds of minefields and things like that. So 2023, it fizzled out. And now we come to the fourth phase, which is 2024, which is Russian offensive right now. Uh, years ago, I said to myself, uh, I will see about Russian military capability if they capture Avdeevka, which is the suburb of Donetsk. Finally, after two years of the war, they did it. They captured Avdeevka and now they keep rolling. They keep rolling every day. There's more and more uh, villages that are taken over at the entire front of uh, 1,000 kilometers. Uh, that is now Russia is on the roll. Now, why? Uh, I Partly I already uh, discussed that with you, but let me just summarize. Uh, it is not only uh, that there's high morale, that also, not only there are volunteers, not only that there is um, confidence in leadership, uh, it also the capacity to produce uh, war material. That's what it is. Uh, Russia the West shouldn't forget, is a highly industrial country. All these factories that were sort of dormant during this sort of uh, 1990s and beyond the years of Western investment and consumerism, now all of a sudden uh, sanctions 
pushed didn't leave Russians a choice but to produce it themselves. The war didn't leave a choice but to produce themselves. And they did. And they adapted. And they started producing something they'd never produced before, the drones and all kinds of helicopters and, and tanks. And, and it just goes by thousands and thousands and thousands, uh, the, the production. Moreover, they discovered that that had an overall growing effect on the economy. And the economy is booming. 2023 was 3% growth and Putin said for 2024 the plan is 4 to 5% growth and uh, according to uh, the uh, PP uh, parity of uh, purchasing power PPP uh, Russian economy I'm not an economist but I think it makes sense has uh, surpassed that of Germany and it is now the fifth in the world and is on the eve of surpassing Japan's economy and if that happens in 2024-25 Putin boasted Russia would be the fourth largest economy in the world with a population only 150 uh, million which is very very little compared to 330 of the United States a billion and a half for China and a billion and a half for India so Russia is a serious military economic power. Moreover, they also um, have huge resources uh, of, of just about anything you need. And, and the paradox is that the sanctions were supposed to stop the Russian economy, but they actually forced them to do it themselves. And now let me say this. For the first time in history, Russia does not need the West economically or technologically. Anything that it wants, that it cannot produce itself or hasn't learned yet how to produce itself, it can get in the East. It can get in China, it can get in India, it can get in, in, in Latin America. And if there's a few items that only the West has, it can buy it through the help of the friends, uh, friendly nations. Uh, that are willing to, uh, to, to make business and to sell the Russians uh, whatever they need. So the West said that this economic success is like Keynesian economics. No, it's not Keynesian. No, it's not. It's, it's basically state-run industry. In many ways, it's Soviet military industry that is now working for Russia and working with great success. Now, uh, what comes in the future, uh, I suppose I can do a separate video discussing the future. But the fact is that Russia is on the roll and it is going to win. There's no doubt whatsoever. If the West decides to send their own troops uh, uh, to save Ukraine uh, or to save their skin uh, and their NATO, uh, then uh, uh, President Putin said yesterday that in that case Russia would have to use nuclear weapons. That would be an act of war. And let me just say that it's, it sort of makes sense. Suppose that uh, Mexico asked for Russian missiles that would shoot into the territory of the United States. I, I think the United States would consider Russia to be a party of war uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, act accordingly. So this is what the U.S. Uh, is doing. It's poking the Russian bear and one day it just may poke too much and get back a, a, a pretty serious uh, response. So it's a dangerous times, but I hope we'll survive it. Um, thank you. And uh, until next edition of uh, Russian History with Dr. Brovkin.